Hello everyone, this is Aidan for Fluid Mechanics 101 and today I'm going to be talking to you about what are thermal or temperature wall functions, why are they needed and how are they applied. So just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to start off by introducing thermal or temperature wall functions and explaining why they're needed. And the second part of the talk, I'll be briefly going over how thermal wall functions are different to momentum or velocity wall functions. And in a previous video, I covered the velocity wall functions and this section will really highlight how the thermal wall functions are different and what additional things the CFD codes need to consider when they apply thermal wall functions. And to finish off the talk, as always, I'll be diving in deep to what the CFD codes actually do so you get a better idea of what's going on behind the scenes. So starting off, what are thermal wall functions and why do we need them? Now in a wall bounded flow, as we approach the wall, we're going to have a profile of velocity and a profile of temperature as we approach the wall. And we've got two sketches there, the sketch on the left being what a typical velocity profile might look like and the sketch on the right showing what a typical temperature profile might look like as we approach the wall. And of course, the free stream value far from the wall, U infinity or T infinity. And then as we approach the wall and we get closer to the wall, the gradient of velocity and the gradient of temperature gets steeper and steeper as we approach the wall. And of course, at the wall, the velocity takes a value of zero for the no slip condition and the temperature takes a value of the wall temperature. Now, because the gradients get steeper as we approach the wall, typically in a finite volume CFD code, what we have to do is the cells have to get smaller and smaller as we approach the wall in order to really capture and resolve those gradients. And it's important to remember that we need to resolve the gradients as accurately as we can when we get close to the wall as the gradients are ultimately what determine the wall shear stress, tower wall, and the wall heat transfer QW. And of course, integrating the wall shear stress will tell us our separation behavior on our wall and ultimately the overall forces on our wall, whatever that may be. So I think it's just worth pointing out here that while the velocity at the wall is going to be zero from the no slip condition, the temperature of the wall, of course, can be colder or hotter than the free stream value. So our temperature profile may look like either of these profiles that you can see uh, on the screen in front of you. But the wall treatment that we use for temperature is the same, regardless of whether the wall is colder or hotter than the free stream flow. So what's the motivation for a thermal wall function? Why do we want it? Why do we need a wall function? Now remember that in a second order finite volume CFD code, the variation of quantities between cells is piecewise linear. So what that means is that as we approach the wall, because the gradient gets steeper, we need really, really thin cells and we need lots of cells in order to capture that gradient correctly. And that's the approach we can see in the diagram on the left. Now, Often we don't want to use small cells, we'd like to use a much larger cell near the wall and that can be to reduce the overall cell count for our simulations and also to uh, improve the aspect ratio of those cells. So the cells that are very close to the wall, which you can see there in the left plot, have a high aspect ratio which is typically not the best for the stability of the CFD solver and can sometimes lead to skewed cells near the wall as well which are poor for stability. So what we'd like to do is replace that piecewise linear variation, which you can see on the left, with some kind of non-linear variation between that cell centroid and the wall. And if we can do that, if we can get that non-linear variation correct, then we can use a large cell close to the wall and hopefully still maintain an accurate solution in our CFD code. So the motivation here is, very, is exactly the same as for the momentum and velocity wall functions. We'd like to use large cells near the wall and we're going to do that by using a nonlinear variation. So the obvious question is, what is that nonlinear variation? What should it be? What should we model it on? 
and once again the same with the velocity wall functions we use direct numerical simulation or DNS data to show what the shape of that profile is for real as we actually approach the wall and the two plots you can see there in the figure we have temperature on the left and velocity on the right and you can see that overall that shape of the profile as you approach the wall is actually very similar between temperature and velocity so this tells us that actually we can probably use a similar approach for temperature as we did for velocity but there are likely to be some small differences and that's really the focus of the presentation today and that's what I'm going to point out to you. Of course remember with these near wall plots as always the x-axis scale y star or y plus is on a logarithmic axis and the y axis is in a linear axis so that's not the shape of the actual profile it's just this is how the data is often shown for convenience always good to remember that so what functions can we fit to this data now that black line which you just saw there the DNS data is the target solution or what the function actually looks like and the standard approach to fitting that data is to fit two functions so to fit a blue line there in the viscous sublayer or when y star is less than 5 and to fit a logarithmic profile that's the green line for y plus greater than 30 and of course remembering that this is a semi log plot so the x axis is logarithmic so that logarithmic fit for y plus greater than 30 looks linear in the figure and exactly as with the velocity or momentum wall functions what we see is that this approach of using two separate functions gives good accuracy for y plus less than 5 in the viscous sublayer and also good accuracy in the logarithmic region for y plus greater than 30 and less than around 200 and as always that buffer region between 5 and 30 is not very well resolved with this approach so we generally try and keep our meshes with a y star either less than 5 or greater than 30 to avoid that region so what are the functions what are the mathematical form of the functions we use and equation one here that you can see is for the viscous sublayer so that was the blue line that we saw before and equation two there is for the green line and that's for the logarithmic region and what you can see is that for the viscous sublayer t star the dimensionless temperature is equal to the Prandtl number times by y star which is the dimensionless wall distance and if you think back to that previous talk that I gave on the velocity wall functions you can see that that form is almost identical to the momentum wall function with the exception of this uh, Prandtl number parameter and for equation 2 if you once again think back to that video I did on the momentum wall functions you can see once again that the form is very similar t star is equal to the uh, logarithmic variation of y star however we've now got two more differences from the momentum wall functions that we saw before we can see that that entire expression is multiplied by the turbulent Prandtl number and we've also got an additional function p in there and this is really to shift the profile to match the data as I'll show you a bit later but up until now we can see that actually we can see the analogy between the momentum and the thermal wall functions they really are very similar and once again I should I'm just going to point out for you what these dimensionless quantities actually are so we've got y star which is the dimensionless wall distance y normal to the wall multiplied by the density friction velocity and divided by the dynamic viscosity and this is the the standard approach for defining dimensionless wall distances and we have a similar uh, dimensionless quantity for the temperature and it's worth noting here that the friction velocity u tau is based on the square root of the turbulent kinetic energy k rather than the wall shear stress and I'm not going to go into the reasons in this video why we choose to use that rather than the uh, common square root of the wall shear stress but as far as we're for following on now it's worth just pointing out that that's what is conventionally used for the thermal or temperature wall functions. So what effect does the Prandtl number have on these empirical functions? 
you may remember from that previous slide that the viscous sublayer is the same, has the same form as the momentum wall function, with the exception of this molecular prandt number. And as far as the analysis we're looking at, wall functions, the Prandtl number is the ratio of the momentum and the thermal diffusivity. So thinking about it, it is does make sense why that parameter would crop up here when we're talking about a thermal wall function rather than a momentum wall function. And for all these standard wall functions you'll find in the literature, the turbulent Prandtl number is effectively a constant. And the molecular Prandtl number, really what it does is it determines the shape of that thermal boundary layer and that thermal wall function. So the momentum and thermal boundary layers typically don't have the same thickness and the same shape. And the ratio of the two shapes is governed by this molecular Prandtl number. And as far as common application goes, it's worth noting that the molecular Prandtl number for air is 0.71 and the molecular Prandtl number for water is 5.68. So really we expect to get different shapes of boundary layer for air and for water. So what does that look like in practice? Now what I've got for you here is a comparison of what the uh, thermal wall functions look like for water and for air. So air is shown there in, with the solid lines, the blue and the green line, and water is shown there for the dashed lines, the blue dashed line and the green dashed line. And what we can see straight away is that actually the value of the dimensionless temperature is different for the two. So water is much higher than for air. And also more interestingly, the intersection point, Y star sub L, as we're gonna call it here, is different for the two profiles. So for water, it occurs a bit earlier at 7.6 and for air, it occurs a bit later at 13.2. So this behavior straight away is different to what we see for the momentum wall functions where if you remember back, the momentum wall functions, they intersect at a Y star of 11.25. So as you expect, that's between water and between air. So really what we have to think about with these thermal wall functions is that actually the shape of the profiles is gonna be different depending on the fluid that we're modeling. Whereas for the momentum wall functions, after those profiles have been uh, non-dimensionalized with the appropriate viscosity and wall shear stress, the profiles collapse and, the, and they're the same. But for the thermal wall functions, that's not the case and it depends on the fluid we're modeling. So what about this function P that we saw in the logarithmic profile? That was the, the third difference that we saw between the momentum and the thermal wall functions. It turns out that P is another empirical function and if we dig into the data and some source code, we find that the most common form of that P function is given there in equation five. And once again, it's just uh, a function of the uh, molecular Prandtl number and the turbulent Prandtl number. And in effect, what this function P does is it shifts that logarithmic curve up and down on the axis as we saw before. So if I flip back a slide, we can see that that logarithmic axis green for water is much higher for air than for air. So all that P function has done is shifted the curve up, which changes the intersection point for water. And for those of you who are a bit more curious about this P function, I encourage you to go ahead and read the PhD thesis. It's quite long, or if you don't have time for that, it's just sufficient to understand that the only effect of that P function is to shift the logarithmic curve up and down to change the intercept. So now, once again, we're going to dive back into what do CFD codes actually do? And a brief reminder, what we know, we know the temperature of the wall, T sub W, and we know the temperature at that adjacent cell centroid. So the cell that's adjacent to the wall, the solver is going to return that, uh, that temperature. And, for the, and we also know the temperature at the wall, TW. So at first glance, you might think, oh, what we do with the wall function is we use the wall function to calculate what the value at the cell centroid is, TP, but that's not the case. We already know what the value at the cell centroid is, TP. We've solved that in our CFD solver. But what we actually want to know is the heat transfer, QW, at the wall. So we use the wall functions to get that 
heat transfer correct. So what do we do for the momentum wall functions? Now for the momentum wall functions, it's fairly straightforward. We know the velocity at the cell centroid, we know the velocity at the wall, and what we do then is we modify the near wall viscosity. So if our cell is very thin and we're in the viscous sublayer, that near wall viscosity is just given by the lamina viscosity. And if we're in the logarithmic region, that means our profile between the centroid and the wall is actually nonlinear, that larger cell that we want. And so we modify the near wall viscosity there as it's shown in equation six. And what that means is, is that from the momentum wall functions, the wall shear stress tau wall is going to be predicted correctly regardless of what our value of, uh, of y star is. So we can have our cells really thin or really large and what we do is we use a conditional statement to switch between what the value of the near wall viscosity is. And if you'd like a bit more information on that momentum wall function I encourage you to go back and watch my previous video where it's explained a bit more fully. But we're going to take a similar approach for the thermal wall function. So firstly we think about what do we do if the cell is in that viscous sublayer? So what if our cell is very close to the wall and our Y star is less than that transitional value Y star sub L? Well, in that case, the variation between the cell centroid and the wall is linear, so we can calculate what the wall heat flux is. And from Fourier's law, we know that's K, the thermal conductivity, multiplied by the gradient of temperature at the wall. And for all these derivations here, it's more convenient instead of writing K to re-express that as that the product of the density, the specific heat capacity and the thermal diffusivity alpha. So in equation eight, you can see that small substitution that's made there. That tends to make the derivations a lot easier later on. And because the variation is linear, it's straightforward and we can work out what the wall heat flux is. Not a problem. But what do we do if we have a larger cell and our variation between the wall is nonlinear. Now, we know what that nonlinear variation is because we did an empirical fit to that direct numerical simulation data earlier. And so what we can do is we can take our expression for T star and rearrange it to find out what the wall heat flux is. And after a bit of manipulation, we get the form there, which we can see in equation 11. So. That's the equation for our heat flux there. And before we move on, we need to think about what we're actually doing here. We want to predict, predict the same heat flux if the variation between the cell centroid and the wall is linear or if it's nonlinear. So what we do is we equate the two expressions. So there we've got that linear expression on the left and on the right we've got that log law expression. So the the heat flux if the variation is, is non-linear between the cell centroid and the wall. And now that we've equated the two, we can rearrange and what we find at the bottom is that we'll get the same wall heat flux for that non-linear variation if we modify the near wall thermal diffusivity alpha. Now if you think back to that momentum wall function, what we do is we modify the near wall kinematic viscosity nu. And so it makes sense and it follows through analogy that we do a similar thing for the thermal wall function. So just to recap, what are we doing overall? First thing we do is we evaluate Y star for our cell. Are we in the viscous sublayer? Do we have a Y star less than the critical value? Or are we in the logarithmic region and our Y star is greater than that critical value? And then what we do is we modify our near wall diffusivity using uh, equation 14. And what that means is, is that when we use equation 15 and we assume the variation between the cell centroid and the wall is linear, we will always get the same heat flux. And the way we do that is by selecting the value of our near wall thermal diffusivity alpha wall. And that turns out to be a very useful thing for CFD codes to do because you can use the same treatment of gradients across all of your cells, where you say the variation between cell centroids and each other and the walls are all linear. However, if our cell is adjacent to a wall, then we include a conditional if statement and modify 
that near wall diffusivity if we're in that logarithmic region. So what I'm going to do now is just run through quickly the overall process for what a CFD code will use. And the CFD code will undergo this process every iteration for every boundary cell. So for every cell in the mesh that's in contact with the wall, and if we're running a thermal analysis with an energy equation, so what's the process? First thing we do is we evaluate Y star, that's our dimensionless wall distance, using the value of the turbulent kinetic energy from the previous iteration. We then calculate our molecular Prandtl number, PR. And with that molecular Prandtl number, we can use it to compute that intersection point between the two curves. So if you remember before that the curve that we have in the viscous sublayer and the curve that we have in the logarithmic region, they intersect at a certain point, but we don't know what the CFD code doesn't know what that point is. So every iteration, the CFD code will calculate the intersection point using some kind of iterative uh, analysis to compute, compute the root of where the two curves intersect. And then what it will do is to see for that particular cell, is the value of Y star less than or greater than that intersection point? And based on that information, we then compute the effective near wall diffusivity, alpha, for all the cells. Now, some of the cells may be in the viscous sublayer, some of the cells may be in the logarithmic region, but with this treatment, we can account for all the cells in the mesh and get them correct. And then finally, once we know the, the effective thermal diffusivity, we can compute the wall heat flux. And this procedure repeats with each iteration until the CFD code converges. So now that I've given you an overview of what the CFD code actually does, I'm just going to finish off by noting the small uh, alterations that we make when we have a compressible flow calculation. So in a compressible flow calculation, actually those uh, DMS profiles that we saw before aren't accurate. And the reason for that is we have additional viscous heating um, which modifies the near wall temperature profile. And the way CFD codes will do that is by modifying those profiles. As you can see in equations 16 and 17, we add an additional term to account for that viscous heating, which increases the temperature at a given distance from the wall. Now, for time, I'm not going to go into what these terms are, but I'll leave links in the description to the, uh, to the video down below, and I may discuss them in more detail in future videos. So just to point out a few useful references to you, the ANSYS Fluent user manual is always very useful and covers much of the discussion as I've done here. Then I've got a link to the paper where that original P function is, uh, is defined if you're interested in actually looking at the empirical fitting in a bit more detail. And finally, a very, very useful uh, internal report from Chalmers University in Sweden where they discuss the thermal wall function and the momentum and other turbulence wall functions in a lot more detail. And as always, leave all your comments uh, and any criticisms or feedback or even errors that you might find in the description below. And I look forward to seeing you there.